Hello everyone, welcome to the session two 2022 update for Altec 782. I want to begin by complimenting you on your Critical Reflection 1 video reflections. I thought you did an excellent job summarizing the Tuzan et al. article, thinking about the characteristics of DBR and applying those characteristics as a lens through which to think about the Tuzan et al. article. So well done all around. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the features of DBR. You did a nice job covering these in your critical reflections, and I think they're pretty clearly articulated. But the main takeaway is that DBR is theoretically oriented, interventionist, collaborative, responsively grounded, and iterative. So what I want to do now is address some of the questions that came up in your critical reflections. So one question you might be wondering, was the Tuzan et al. study a bad study? Well, actually, not at all. By some metrics, it's a rather good study. So for example, if we take a look at Google Scholar, we can see that that particular 2009 article has been cited 833 times. That's quite a bit for an education study. So in that sense, the article was quite successful. In addition, it was peer-reviewed and published in a rather prestigious journal. In 2009, Computers and Education was ranked 57 out of over 840 education journals, so that's the top quartile. And as you may know, now in 2022, Computers and Education is actually the number three journal in all of education. So in many ways, by these metrics of scholarship, this was a good study that added value to the field. However, we might question whether or not the research yielded conclusive results or practical results, and we might ask the question of whether or not practitioners believed that they could use the results of this work to improve their practice on the ground. And in that sense, it probably falls a little bit short, as does much education research. Now, another question that came up is, well, what makes a problem real or practical in DBR terms? So let's talk a little bit about that. Well, broadly speaking, a problem is real and or practical if it is experienced and articulated by practitioners working in authentic context. Now, what do we mean by practitioners? Well, this is essentially anyone working in the field. In our case, it might be educators or trainers, but it could be people in corporate settings or in nursing programs or in the military. It doesn't really matter. The fact of it is those practitioners that are knowledgeable are able to say a particular phenomenon is not working in the authentic context. So that's part of what makes a problem real or practical. In other words, these problems are born from the field as opposed to the laboratory or solely through trying to advance theory. Now, we might think of these problems as being rooted in the acknowledgement that the way a particular phenomenon, phenomenon X, is done is not working optimally. In other words, the current state. And this current state can be contrasted with visions of what things could be or should be like. So we could think about some future desired states. This, of course, is quite closely related to instructional design, comparing and contrasting the current state to the desired state. Now, another question that came up is, well, what is an intervention? So an intervention can actually take many forms. It might be a piece of software. It might be a lesson or a workshop or a community that's formed. But an intervention is typically thought of as a tangible innovation designed with intention to address a specific problem occurring in a specific context by a specific group of people. So look how grounded that is. It's a specific problem in a specific context by a specific group of people. It's not the broad problem in the Tuzan et al. article of students don't know a lot or are not motivated to learn geography. That is a very high level problem. And an intervention is designed to deal with a very specific problem with a specific group of learners in a specific setting. 
Importantly, iterative designs and implementations are used to improve and refine the intervention over time. It's not a one and done design and implementation. There's an acknowledgement in the DBR mindset that the initial instantiation of the intervention is probably not going to be perfect. In fact, it might be quite bad in a number of ways. And so it's really embracing this iterative process and that through intentional, deliberate iteration, eventually the intervention will improve and become effective. So what are some priorities for DBR? Well, making sure the intervention works to solve the problem in the target context is really a primary priority. In addition, design-based research wants to understand when and where the intervention works, as well as where it doesn't work. Thirdly, a DBR priority is understanding why that intervention works and doesn't work. So the why is really crucial there. And then finally, the goal is to extract principles from that successful intervention that might generalize to similar problems and or contexts. And that's the looping back to make contributions to theory by extracting those principles, articulating them, and sharing them with others. Now, we could dig a little bit deeper into this question of what is an intervention, acknowledging that specificity matters when thinking about interventions for DBR. An intervention, importantly, must be embodied or operationalized in some specific manner. And because of that, that means design decisions need to be made and specified. So what are some common areas that need to be defined or described for a DBR intervention? We'll talk more about this later in the semester, but some of the areas include the tools and materials. In other words, what tools or materials are going to be used as part of the embodied or operationalized intervention? Secondly, what are the task structures? In other words, what are the tasks that people are going to do with those tools and materials? Those need to be defined and described in detail. Participant structures also need to be described. The participant structures include how are the people involved in the intervention going to be organized or grouped? How are they going to relate to one another? How are they going to engage with the tasks that ultimately involve the tools and materials? And then finally, what discursive practices are going to surround all of that? In other words, how are people going to talk about the participant groupings, the tasks with those tools and materials to promote the desired artifacts and interactions that we think actually might bring about change to the specified problem. So those are four common areas that need to be defined and described when thinking about an intervention. Now, another question that came up is, well, how is theory used in DBR? Well, briefly, it's used in multiple ways. Theory can be used to support the initial design of the intervention itself. It can also be used to, to guide the implementation of the intervention. And thirdly, it can be used to assist with the framing of how the impact of the intervention is evaluated. So in all of those aspects of DBR, theory has a role to play. Now, I just wanted to close out with one last thought here. If I was to redesign this meta-methodology slide shared in the 2020 video, I would actually move design-based research up to about here. And the point being that it's a meta-methodology in that at any given time, it can leverage any or all of these particular strategies or techniques. And of course, we can use these strategies and techniques to help us think about the design of the intervention, the implementation of the intervention, as well as the evaluation of the intervention's impact. Okay, everyone, that's all for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.